there and welcome once again to It's a Mystery. I'm Neil Buchanan and joining me in this brand new series are Gail Porter and Tristan Banks. And as a team, we're going to be investigating some of the most incredible mysteries you're ever likely to hear. Tristan and I will be going off to search out some amazing stories that are going to astound and baffle you. And together in the studio, we'll be attempting to solve those unbelievable mysteries that gobsmack us all. Now at times, it's going to be weird, a little spooky, but one thing's for sure, it's going to amaze you. So stick around, because in today's show, what was the strange white mass that lurked at the bottom of a family's garden? We find out what it's like to live in what's supposed to be the most spooky village in England. And we check out the mysteries of stings and how to treat them. Right then, let's kick off this brand new series with a mystery that's completely unbelievable, but true. It's a mystery what lurked at the bottom of a Devon garden. Come on, John. Coming. Oh, what is it? Free one to me? Mm -hmm. Picture this. A family who live in the outskirts of a town in a small village were whiling away their afternoon in the back garden. They had recently decided to move to the countryside village in order to get away from the hustle and the bustle of the town. Here you go, sir. The children were also having fun in the garden. However, they were completely unaware of the events which were about to happen. On the stroke of three o'clock, the calmness of this charming afternoon setting began to turn into absolute chaos. of something was growing at an increasing rate at the bottom of the garden. Wondering whether he was seeing things, the husband went over to his wife to point it out. Sue, look. What the? Although the father was very nervous, he was also very intrigued at the growing mass. What is it? I don't know. The closer they got, the higher the mound became. The children had also never seen anything like it. Come on. Hey, look. What? They crept up to their parents to take a closer look. Uh, Mum, what is it? I have no idea. It's alien sick. Uh. Come on, then. It was the better than anything they'd ever seen in any film before. What on earth was this strange phenomenon? Well, believe it or not, the huge, terrifying white mass turned out to be a hideous, creeping mound of bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it that caused the mysterious bubbles? Could it have, in fact, been aliens from another planet? Or, Neil, could it have been something from a parallel universe? <laughs> yeah, 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 very funny. So come on, guys, what's going on? Where did the bubbles come from? Well, actually, this story was based on a true story which happened in April last year. The cause of the bubbles turned out to be nothing more than this, shampoo. 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 Yup. When you mix shampoo with water, you get a mass of bubbles, lots of them. Yeah, but hang on, you didn't mention anything about water. Where did the water come into the story? Ah, uh, now, what I didn't tell you was that the family actually had a stream running along the bottom of their garden. So, how did the shampoo get into the stream then? Ah, well, I actually did a bit of my own research, and look what I found. A local newspaper reported that there had been an accidental shampoo leak from a nearby cosmetics factory. So the shampoo had unfortunately got mixed up in the water, frothed up at the bottom of the garden, creating an unbelievably huge nine metre mass of frothing bubbles. <laughs> Stings. Don't you just hate being stung? Well, it's a mystery how to cure a sting, whether it's a plant sting or an insect sting. Well, usually the pain from a sting is because it's a poison rather than a bite. 
Many of the plant and animal kingdoms sting as a form of defence against danger or to stun their dinner into submission. Hmm. Well, what about bees and wasps? They're always buzzing around during the summer. Well, a wasp sting under a microscope looks like this. Look at that. It's a long pointed sting coming out of its backside. Now, a bee sting, on the other hand, has a similar long point but has sharp barbs sticking out along its edge. And on the end of both stings is a sack of poison, a bit like this. Now, if you get stung by a wasp, he'll jab the sting into your skin, like that, squirt out the poison, and then fly away. The bee sting, on the other hand, because of its barbed edge, it'll jam the sting into your skin, and it'll stay there while it squirts out the poison. The whole sting and poison sac is actually ripped from the bee's body, and it stays in you. The next sting is one to watch out for, particularly when you're on holiday or swimming in the sea. Have you guessed it? Well, you'll know what I'm talking about if you've ever been stung by one of these babies. Jellyfish. Now these are just small ones, but you can get them much, much bigger swimming around in the sea. And jellyfish have hundreds of stinging cells on each of the tentacles that hang down from their body. And if one of these cells is touched, it triggers it to fire a kind of tiny harpoon-like dart into its prey. The dart contains a nerve toxin, which is effective in stunning plankton and small fish. Ooh. Now you could always get stung by a nettle. On each nettle leaf are hundreds of tiny hollow hairs, which under the microscope look like this. Each of the stinging hairs has a sharp but fragile tip, which is protected by a kind of lid or cap until the slightest touch. So, OK, how do you cure these stings? Well, obviously, prevention is better than cure. Neither a bee nor a wasp will go out to sting you deliberately. So if one is flying around, it's best to try and keep still. Now, wasps are more likely to sting you towards the end of summer, when they're grumpy and dozy, or when they're annoyed. But if you do get stung by a wasp, you can treat it with vinegar. Now, a bee actually dies if it stings you, and it'll only sting you if it's being attacked. So try not to annoy him. If you are stung by a bee, it's very acidic and can be treated with bicarbonate of soda. You know, the baking stuff. And what about the jellyfish sting? Well, most jellyfish floating around in Britain shouldn't hurt you. But if you're uh, a tough Aussie bloke like me, you might come face to face with something like a box jellyfish, which is only about the size of your hand, but its sting could prove fatal unless you're rushed to hospital immediately. And if you're a plankton or small fish, you'd be dinner. And what about the cure for the nettle sting? Well, it's nature's own remedy, dock leaves. They always seem to be growing near nettles, and if you rub them onto the sting, it's all better. Mmm. What? Actually, mm. between you and me, there's no medical reason why a dock leaf should heal the irritation. It's only because the dock leaf is flat and big and cool <laughs> that it sometimes helps to soothe the sting slightly. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I don't care what you say, whether it's all in my mind, but dock leaves do make it feel better for me, thank you. <laughs> mm. <laughs> So, do you believe in ghosts? Well, some people do, and some people don't. I'm not sure myself. And you know, neither are the people who live in what's supposed to be the most haunted place in England. Pluckley is the perfect village nestling in the county of Kent. And some people think Pluckley is supposed to be the most haunted corner of England. Some say there are ghosts, some say there aren't. But here are just a few reports of some weird goings on over the years. Some people insist that they've seen a ghost of the watercress woman here at Pinnock Bridge. Watercress? She's said to be the gypsy woman who used to sell watergrass watergrass, in the village. Sir? On the outskirts of Pluckley, there's a woodland called Deering Wood sometimes known as the Screaming Woods. Some years ago, a waterboard inspector and his wife were out for a stroll. They were used to hearing the noises of the countryside, but the eerie scream was unlike anything they'd ever heard before. Scared out of their minds, they ran from the woods.
There's also a triangular island of land in Pluckley. Some people call it Fright Corner. And it's here that there have been reported sightings of the shadowy figure of a highwayman on his horse. Scary stuff. I'm not convinced though, and you know, neither are some of the villagers themselves. I've lived in Plackley for 15 years, eight of those in a 15th century house. I do, I've never seen a ghost, I don't believe in ghosts. I think they're all a complete fabrication, including the one about the watercress lady at Pinnock Bridge. Well, several years ago, we came here uh, to run the tea rooms, and we didn't know anything about the place at all, but We've had lots of unexplainable things, um, but so there must be ghosts, but they're very friendly, and I love living here. So, some of the people in the village don't mind the tales, and others think that a load of old rubbish. And you know, it seems there are explanations for some of these strange occurrences. So, what's known as Fright Corner, where the highwayman is said to be seen, isn't Fright Corner. It's actually Frith Corner, a place next to Frith Woods. And also, many people who live here reckon the screaming woods, where the couple heard the awful screams, don't scream at all. They say it's just the sound of foxes screeching. And what about the watercress woman? Well, I reckon that might just be a bit of an old wives' tale too. Here's a strange story. It's a mystery why a normal girl who lives a normal life in a normal town claims to have an electrical jinx. Hello, my name is Gemma Britton. I'm 12 years of age and I come from Ashford in Kent. Recently, some really weird things have been happening to me, so I thought I would tell you about them. One day, I went round my friend Charlie's house to go on her computer. When I got there and started it up, we experienced a problem. It wouldn't work. Charlie couldn't understand it. It had been working perfectly the day before, and when I left, it worked okay as well. A few days later, I went round my friend Debbie's house. We went on her computer, but when we went on it, the screen went all fuzzy. We couldn't make any sense out of it at all. This set me thinking. I'd been near a computer twice, both in good working order until the moment I went near them, but when I moved away, they started working again. And just the other day, I went to log on to this computer, but it wouldn't log on. Minutes after I left, it began to work again. A couple of days later, I went round my friend Sadie's house. We were hungry, so we decided to cook scrambled egg on toast. I put the bread in the toaster and turned it on, but to my surprise, the toaster went funny and stopped working. So not only are computers breaking when I go near them, but other electrical appliances break too. Fascinating stuff. Imagine just how Gemma must feel not knowing what happens every time she goes near an electrical appliance. But you know, She's not alone. There are numerous reports of this sort of thing happening all over the country. Earlier on this year, there were reports in the national press of vacuum cleaners that blew up, kettles that fused, and televisions that changed channel on their own. So, OK, what's happening? Well, one theory about this strange phenomena is that we're all living in an invisible electronic smog. There are so many electronic signals in the air from things like televisions, radios, mobile phones, etc. And all of these things contribute to an electromagnetic overload in the atmosphere. Now, it's thought that most of us are unaffected by this. But occasionally, some people react with it, causing interference with electrical equipment. So could this be what's happening to Gemma? There's just no explanation. It's a real mystery. Big spider. Right. And don't worry. This mystery is not about spiders, because it's a mystery what your handwriting says about you. Uh -huh, especially <laughs> yours, Neil. Uh -oh. Looking at yours there, you can see that you've got very big handwriting. You dot your eyes with a circle, mm. but and also your letters are very, very upright. 
Mm. All right, let's see what all this could mean. Oh, there we go. Now, <laughs> Neil's large writing shows that he likes to let people know he's there, the real centre of attention, if you know what I'm saying. And if someone puts circular dots on their eyes, it could be a sign that they like to be noticed. They, they might do this by, by trying to be different. So, when he was at school, Neil was probably the sort of kid who wanted short hair when long hair was in fashion. Nothing's changed. <laughs> Neil's upright writing shows that if he ever comes up against a problem, he never panics, he just thinks about the right thing to do. All right, I have to admit it, that is spot on. That is incredible. I, I don't tend to panic, even in a situation where the, everything's going wrong, I don't panic. And yeah, when I was at school, when everyone had short hair, I did actually had very Beautiful. long hair. But that's just being unfashionable rather uh, than right, not, rather right, wanting right, to be noticed, mate. isn't it? It's your turn, matey, my lad. Now, let's see what you get up to. Oh. Come on, then. L I look forward to this. Now, I don't want to worry you or anything, but for thousands of years, Trace, people have tried to reveal secrets about each other just by looking at their handwriting. Hey. And um, as you can see, compared to my handwriting, Tristan's is somewhat smaller and it's fatter, although it does stand upright like mine. And another big difference is that he dots his eyes with dashes rather than the way I do mine with little circles. What's wrong with dashes? Uh -huh, Tristan. Go for, it again. Go for it. <laughs> well, your smaller, fatter writing could mean that you like to do things by yourself, but then again, you don't mind being interrupted. So, say you're at school, were you the sort of child who, if you were studying for an exam, you would get right into it, but if a friend came over and needed help, you'd be quite willing to drop your stuff and, and give mm, them a hand? I didn't really study it. Mm. No, I did. I did. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And your eyes, Neil pointed out before, you've got your dashes on your eyes. Well, that means that you could be a bit of a perfectionist. So, say if you were colouring something in and you were doing it really well and then suddenly you went over the side a little bit, that would upset you. You'd have to have it perfect. I don't know, I can Perfecto. usually cope with the colouring in thing, but <laughs> true, when I was at, um, when I was, uh, when I sort of watch something back that I've, um, that I've recorded, I, I really pay attention to detail. You're a yeah. perfectionist. Yeah. You might not have coloured in or anything, but you really are a perfectionist. I know, look, he's here. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right, well, she's talking about my short, fat writing. It's time no, I thought it was going to, to get evaluate your writing. Okay, then. Go for it, girl. All right, then. Yeah. Now, I don't want to put you off at all, Gail, <laughs> but um, <laughs> did you know that most large companies in Germany and France actually study people's handwriting before deciding to give them an interview for a job? Thanks for that, Tristan. No stress, though. Do you think don't I'd get a job? Right. Do you think I'd get a job, Ooh, guys? I don't think so. <laughs> no, oh, I'm oh. The thing that sets your writing apart from Neil's and mine is that yours leans over to the right. Mm -hmm. Now, writing that slants to the right could mean that sometimes your feelings make you act very quickly. Like, for example, Gail Porter, if you see something in a shop that you want, you'll just go ahead and buy it, even if you haven't got the money to do it. Now, that's true about no, you, isn't it? No, you don't go shopping. Is, she does. What would you do? Know she's like with the shopping. That is so <laughs> true. Listen, I don't believe it. You must have got that information from my mother. Oh, it's brilliant. So, it was really true for me. Yeah. It was very true for yeah. you. And it was so true for, Yeah, brilliant. yeah, I'd say that's that. Right, isn't Fascinating it? stuff. It's amazing what your handwriting says about you. That's it, that's it for the first show. We've managed to solve some mysteries, but plenty remain. So don't forget to join us next time for some more. In the meantime, here's one last mystery for you. A man walks into a cafe and asks for a glass of water. Instead, the waitress pops a balloon above his head. He thanks her. Why? Can you solve the mystery? Just think about it, and we'll let you know the answer next time. See ya. See ya.